morning all. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, just to, to introduce myself, my name's uh, Mike Holloway. I'm a data scientist working with uh, Mike, Will, Phil, Sue and John in uh, UKCH. So I'm going to attempt another live demo. So as always, hopefully it could be very short, could be uh, perfect. So I'm just going to give you a little whistle stop tour of um, data lab for the platform, what, what it is and how and some bits and uh, main features. And then I'm going to hand you over to Will, who's going to show you the really exciting stuff related to uh, the Elta platform. So without further ado, I'll try and share my screen. Hopefully it works. Can can you see that at all? Is that working? Yeah, yeah that's come through. Thank you. Perfect. Right. So the idea of Data Labs, it's a collaborative analytical platform. And the first and foremost thing is, is you don't, there's, the, um, it's trying to break down barriers between um, coders, non-coders, data people, and also even sharing your results with um, policymakers and things like that at the other end. So it, can, it, it serves different levels of um, user abstraction, as we call it. And the first and foremost way of breaking down that barrier is all you need to access Data Labs is a web browser. So you just go to that URL there and it will take you to this landing page. So I will sign in. That's all you need to do. If you don't have an account, you can create an account on Data Labs, but you just need an e use an introduction or email address. So I'll put it in now. And if I remember my password, I should be able to go into the system. So when you log into Data Labs of Standards, if you're a new user, you will come to this page and it will be blank because by default, is we use project structures to sort of compartmentalize various data sets and analytics. So if you're a new user, you it's filtered by projects you have access to by default. Um, so this page would be blank, but as you can see, I've got several projects down the side here. And the idea is, is this project, so like I said, one is to sort of split things into particular, so you could have a biodiversity area, ecology, freshwater ecology area, but um, also it's a sort of level of security because if you have certain data that you can't share widely just yet, you don't want to publish in the registry or anything, you can sort of use the admin rights of the project to mean only particular people in that project have access to the data. So I will just click this button here. It shows you that there's quite a wealth of projects within the, um, the platform. So you can see there's something about air quality, open air. There's some Becky's and Ben's projects. I don't know what they're about, but the idea is here you can get an idea of what the projects are. And if there's one you want to, to investigate more, you can contact the user to arrange access. So I will quickly show you a project I'm involved with. This is sort of a side project, but it's called it's looking at data science of the natural environment. But this is probably the more and more mature projects on the data labs platform. So you could have an L to one here actually focused, like I say, on a specific area. So when you open a project up, you come to this nice little information page. And the first thing it should have here, this is again in relation to the last presentation, you should have some nice information here telling you what the project's about. I've been naughty and not populated that yet, but I need to do that. So here you will have information going what the project is, a little bit of an overview of what it's for. So it gives the users an idea of what they have access to. These are just some information about the names and then you have different levels of users. So you can, you can see there's an admin, which is myself. And then we have some users of the project here. And again, different levels have different permissions. I'll show you a little bit of that in a second. Um, and so on the main page as well, you have various different aspects of the system. Like I say, I'll do a quick whistle stop tour of what each one is, but I'll start with the project settings. And like I said earlier, this is where you can populate the information. So I could add some info here about the project, display it on the main page. And then down here, you can actually decide what permissions users have. So like I said, if you want to share different levels, so admin can add users, remove users, create data stores, create analytics, and basically have um, sort of master level of the, the system. Users can do some of the lower level stuff like create notebooks and data stores and share things, but they can't uh, add in the project. And then you can have viewers, which is basically read-only access. So you can view things, but you can't access things. So like I said, here you can have different levels of... Um, access for people so you can share respective things um, as, as you choose and that's an element of security like I said if you have data you don't want to fully release yet so you just add someone's add someone's email address there so I'll look for Mike um, and I could add him to the project here and I just give him various um, uh, permissions and what have you so that's the sort of like I said the admin area the next thing I'll go to is storage so within the system we have different types of storage First and foremost, you don't have to bring your data to the system. If you have a way of accessing it programmatically, if you want to link it to the, the various digital assets we've uh, presented previously, you could read the data in from those directly through um, programmatically or um, some sort of interface, you know, like share the URLs and things like Phil showed. That can be done. But if you want to bring your data into the system, we have a couple of different aspects that you can use. So the first and foremost 
is this um, local storage. And this is also where your analytics sit. And I'll touch on that in a second of how this works, the analytics. Um, within this storage, it's small level data. So I'm talking about up to tens of tens of gigabytes. If you've got bigger data, if it's model output or you know sort of terabytes of data, we do have a facility to do that. I can't demo that today, but that is available. So and that can be programmatically linked or ultimately with a file browser. So with this storage system, you can see there's a few data stores here. And again, with the data stores, you can add people within the project of what who has access to the data store. So you can click on this edit button here. Again, information on the data set. And then finally, you can choose which users have which access. So again, if you have certain bits you want to share to the wider project this time, you can set that here as well. And also you can give a bit of information of what the data store has in it. And the other thing you can do is create a new data store. So you just click this nice little button here, if it actually works, yeah. So you give it a little display name, a storage type, as I said, there's only, there's only local storage. You can set the size. There is no particular limit here on the size, but if you request two terabytes, one of the admins will probably say you can't have that and won't let you create the data store. You can give it an internal name. That is a name that appears as if you access it through um, a URL or um, programmatically. And then again, a description of what the data store is. And you hit that create button there and it will appear on this list. And the final thing, you can open the data store up like this. And it's just um, uses this mini.io file browser. You have buckets and things on the side, so little folders. And then within these buckets, you can have folders as well. And this is where you store, uh, this is actually storing um, some uh, analytics as well as some local data. And then the final thing, if you want to put your data in this store, you can actually use this button here. You can create a new bucket, which is one of these sort of compartments on the side or you can actually use the plus button up here to add data to the system, and this will copy it up. I don't know if it's changed, but there was a file sort of upload limit um, at the time, or a number of files you can do, but um, I think we might be allowing add multiple files and increasing the file size allowed at certain points. And just ignore this uh, storage up here. This will tell you how much storage you have left. I think this is reading wrong at the moment because this data store, when it was created with only 10 gigabytes in size, and it's definitely not got 1.3 terabytes in it. So I don't know what's happening there at the moment. So that is the, sort of, uh, the storage aspect of um, the data lab system. Now, analytics, we use these things called um, notebooks. Now I'm going to go give you an overview of what the notebooks are and sort of how they work, but a very brief one. And then I'll actually let Will show when he takes over, I'll let you show an example of one more relevant to the Alta program because all this is related to a side project. So in a nutshell, Jupyter Notebooks, for those of you who haven't used them across them before, or our studio notebooks, are essentially a way of combining code and narrative into one document. So it's, you have the narrative to explain what the code's doing, but then you also have the code there for those that want to see it to see how the actual analysis was done. And within, um, and they're a good collaborative resource because you can work on them side by side. Um, people can access the same system together. And more importantly, if you create a repetitive analysis that you want to use on different sites, share with other users, you can share the notebook with them and they can pick it up and use it without any extra um, installation of software, any tweaking of things. All they have to do is, is adapt it to work with their data set or add a new data set to it if you're using it through a graphical side of things. So the idea is if you've got repetitive workflows, you can just keep reusing it. And more importantly, everyone's working off the same data set because they're mounted in the data stores that I showed you earlier, and everyone's working off the same analytical environment. So there's no inconsistencies there. So within Data Lab, we have three, uh, three different types of notebooks. You can have R Studio for people who use the R software. We have Jupyter Lab, which is more tailored towards Python, but also does some R analyticals. And then we also have Zeppelin, which can deal with Python and R as well, which is more of an older school style of notebook. And you can even bring other languages in as well, but provided they're open source. So we have had them working with Fortran and things. So these are your notebooks down here. And like I said, again, very similar setup before. They have a description of what they do and some information. And what you can also do is you can share them and edit them um, with the system. So with the share, you can create them so only you use them. So only you can see them. You can create them so they're shared with the wider project data store. So anyone who is in the data store can see the notebook. More importantly, they can run the notebook, um, which is uh, which is quite handy. And then we use, oh, actually, I'll show you an example in a second of that. But we use software to make sure that everything is consistent. And again, you can create your notebooks here. So you just give it, again, a display name, the type of notebook you want it to be, um, Jupyter, Jupyter Lab. 
if you do R Studio, you can then pick the version of R that you wanted to use. So I know some people use different versions of software. A URL name. Now, this URL, if you were to paste that into your browser, it would take you straight into the notebook environment and straight into the analytics. And this, like I said, you choose a data store to mount. So if you remember the data store that I showed you earlier, the analytics are mounted directly in the data store, so they're sitting over the data. And again, everyone is working off the same environment. A description of what it does. Sharing status, like I said, you can have it private to you or you can have it project wide so anyone can use and interact with the notebook. This is a bit like not quite like Google level doc yet, although Jupyter are making it work so you could do code like Google Docs. Um, but that's like I said, these analytics, everyone's working for this. If someone breaks the notebook, everyone's with a broken notebook. So we do have sort of version control and things on top of that to help you get over that. And then the final thing is. Um, assets. So we have assets in the system where you can, if you have a data set you want to share with a wider system, you can mount that and it's usable um, straight off the bat. So that's the notebooks and um, how people can interact with them. Um, I will open one up just to show you what it looks like inside, but I'm not going to actually show you the analytics side of things because, like I said, Will will take that on later. So when you open a Jupyter Lab, for example, this is just to show you something about making sure everyone works off the same data set. You have this nice little environment where you can pick particular files to open up. You can access your data, the underlying data store. For those of you who know what Git is, we have Git integration, so you can version control things. And then here you have different, these things are called kernels for the notebook. And basically what they are are different analytical environments. So if you have a particular one that you want to share with everyone and you create it, it will appear here. And if someone selects that particular one in the system, their notebook will be running off the same setup that you did when you created the notebook. So again, the consistency, the collaborative aspect, everyone's working the same. And like I said, we can do things other than, um, for those of you who are analytic people with Fortran and things, you can do that. And again, I won't show it, but you can have terminal access to things. If you are more of a coder, you can do things from the command line as well using a terminal. So I'll, I'll leave it there on the notebook side of things. And then the next thing is, if you have big data, so big analytics, you, we do have software available through, uh, they call Dask and Spark, but if you've got big analytics that you need big processing power, we do have that facility available within the labs that you can hook the notebooks up to. I'll leave it there on the analytics. The final thing is these things called sites. So in, anyone who's familiar with R Shiny knows it's a nice way of running the code in the notebook without having to see the code. It's a graphical interface, but more importantly, everything is running again off the same code base I showed you in the notebooks earlier. And so you can create these, um, these shiny sites and you can share them within the project. Again, very similar setup to way, the way you create notebooks. However, the important thing with the shiny sites, you can make them public as well. So if you want to share them with external people and allow them to, to view the data, this is one thing with policy and decision makers, for example, or people who aren't coders, you can allow them to run the same analytics, access the data, and um, run off um, a diff, uh, you know, run off uh, through a web browser without having to interact with a single line of code if they don't want to. I think that is a very good whistle stop tour of all the features of labs. Mike, Sue, have I missed anything, or you want me to go into any more detail? I don't think you've missed anything. Um, I'm answering questions as they're coming up. Yeah, there are uh, I, there are a few questions in the chat, so you might want to have a look at that, Mike. I'll actually. have a look at those. Yeah, but I think probably the best way to demonstrate the power of labs is probably to show some more relevant things to the ELSA program and show them in action. So I think I'll hand over to Will now to show you um, how he's used the labs to um, deliver some uh, analytics for ELSA. So, Will, here you go. Thank you very much. Uh, let me get my screen sharing set up. Okay. Can everybody see my slides and thanks will yeah very good so i will return to the labs environment in just a second um but i thought before i kind of show anything i'll just give a very quick little bit of background on what we'll be showing so it actually has a bit more a uh, bit more meaning so yeah my name's will bolton i've been a part of the uk ceh crowd um, and I've been working a lot in the labs on the uh, cookie cutting pilot application. Um, as it became apparent early on that it's useful uh, for those working at sites or doing research at sites or using data of the various time sites we have. Um, it's useful 
to integrate external data sets to those sites just to augment data that can't, can't be collected in situ. So integrating statistics or uh, remote sensing data, for example. So using the labs, I've been piloting a solution to this kind of this problem. So just as a bit of background there, so there's two types of data sets that I've been considering to be kind of integrated to the site level. So spatial data is one of those. So there's a, there's a screenshot of some Copernicus data here, um, where obviously the, the greener areas are, are more heavily forested and the, the yellow and the red areas less so. So this type of data, of course, is liable to cover uh, geographic areas that we're interested in, and also because it contain, covers the whole of Europe. Obviously, all of the ELTA uh, sites may be, may be giving or taking a few exotic ones um, will be contained in this data set. So we might want to extract uh, the data relevant to those. But also a second data type that it also became obvious uh, that was needed was uh, tabular or statistical data. So obviously Excel, CSV files, um, which aren't of course directly uh, spatial in nature. But this, this spreadsheet that's popped up um, is an example from uh, Work Package 4, I believe it is, uh, which is employment data uh, from the Eurostat service, which is split up by NUTS administrative regions. So each row corresponds to um, a, a, a geographical region in, in the real world. And then of course, each column contains the various observations. So these are the two types of data that we want to integrate into uh, sites themselves. Um, and the reason that we, we decided to pilot a solution in labs is that obviously a lot of the time with these kinds of data sets, um, they don't, they don't nicely match up to um, the boundaries of the various alpha sites. So using the Cairngorms as an example, on the left here, we can see there's a spatial data set um, that covers the United Kingdom. It's got air pollution data in it. Uh, but in red outlined is the, the Cairngorms National Park. So if we just want that, that section of the data set, we'll have to kind of go through some tedious process of sort of loading the boundaries, overlaying it on the thing, making sure the coordinates are correct, and then eventually taking out some data, which, which, which takes time, and we don't want everybody to be able to do this. Likewise, um, with statistical data, um, most sites won't fit the boundaries of the kind of subdivisions that um, authorities use to provide statistics. So on the right-hand side, again, we have uh, the counties of Scotland, which uh, statistics are often provided for. Uh, and we can see that the Cairngorms kind of overlaps quite a lot of these sites, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit any one. We can't just take one of those counties' numbers and, and, and call it a day. Uh, we have to kind of account for the fact that, yes, these five counties do make up the Cairngorms, but we also want a little bit of additional information about, well, by how much, to what extent uh, do those kind of, are those values applicable? Uh, and again, of course, we have a similar problem to before, figuring out where the boundaries of those counties lie, uh, comparing it with uh, the site that we have in question, it takes a lot of time. So if we can automate this, or the better. So that is what I've been looking at in labs uh, to kind of give this a test run. I've got two data sets here. Um, I've got the, the aforementioned uh, data set of air pollution data. So in Windows Photo here, uh, we can see that this is kind of the rough outline of the polluted areas in the UK. Shipping lanes, of course, uh, North Sea oil rigs, of course, and then the denser areas showing up in white, the more remote areas dark. So this is one data set that we'll, uh, we'll use to test, test this stuff out with. And secondly, again, I have a CSV with three columns of data for every single uh, NUTS region that exists. So to make it nice and easy for us to test. So those are my two data sets. These are sitting on my computer. Um, and I'll show you how that interaction will work in a second. So I just get a few controls out of the way. So I'm logged into the labs with my own account. Um, as Mike mentioned, we do everything by projects and the LTRI does have its own project, 
which which I've been working in. You can see a little list of all of the users of that project so far. Um, but as Mike mentioned, if you if you want to sign up for an account and you want to have a look at any of the things that we've kind of presented, just let me know. I'm sure my email address will be around at some point, and I will uh, add you to this project. So we won't retread all of the ground about how all of the uh, features work, but I'll just point out that these are some of the notebooks that we have in the Alter RI. So a few um, a few test notebooks, but we're starting to do some real uh, real actual work in these. And what I have been looking at is uh, is is yeah solving this problem about how do we kind of process the data sets nicely. So this is the notebook that I've been using. Um, so it's one of the R Studio notebooks. Uh, it's linked uh, via Git to, to a GitHub repo. So this is the Elta RI GitHub page, and this is all of the code that I've been working on, which I've been publishing or backing up um, to GitHub, but actually been doing the development work and testing and running it within, uh, within the lab's infrastructure. Uh, something else that's worth pointing out as well is I think I saw a question in the chat about why not just GitHub? Well, of course, we link with GitHub, but also uh, if I if somebody wants to run this code or sort of do some tests using the exact same version of R and the various packages. So, for instance, one of the libraries uh, that I've been using is called Reticulate. They don't have to worry about messing around with installing that. It's all, all the same versions already pre installed here. And look, I can start running some in the notebook itself. Nothing exciting. So within this notebook itself, um, I've developed an interface in Shine, which is what we can see here. This is uh, uh, the, the R code. And also um, in Python, because it's fine to mix and match uh, in labs with, with languages. Um, so actual code that does the work, uh, and putting these two together, an interface and some code that does the work, uh, we have uh, a system that graphically allows you to kind of process spatial and tabular data sets uh, the way that we were talking about. And it looks like this. So in the sites section of the L2RI project, anybody with access to the project um, can view this cookie cutter site. Um, this has been shared. So uh, you don't need any special access. You don't even need access to the notebook. Uh, to view it, although if you're interested in seeing the source code, and indeed if you're interested in contributing to the source code as well, um, the actual code is sitting in the notebook, but the site itself is open to anybody in the project, and this is roughly what it looks like. So, so I've got a bit of a shaky internet connection today. So the interface itself uh, is a work in progress, of course, you know, it's still early days of the Alpha project. Um, but it's designed to be that you don't have to worry about code and directories and folders and all that jazz. Uh, it's designed to be hopefully as easy to use as possible. Um, and we'll just take it for a spin. Uh, we'll have another live demo of the day. So the way it works at the minute, it's a bit strange, of course, based off feedback. If anybody does have any feedback, by the way, about things that don't make sense. I, I really am all this. This is still being developed. But first, we'll take a look at the, um, the raster data set uh, of air pollution. So um, first thing that we can do is just choose which kind of data set we're working with. So here, we're going to leave it on the default option, which is to uh, plot one of these raster data sets to a site. Uh, out of interest, we can crop these to the boundaries of a nuts region or uh, a dime site. I'm going to stick with a dime site. So there's a hard coded list of sites um, that come out come with the tool out of the box. But actually, a little bit later, we'll see that this is this is integrated live with with dimes SDR, the kind of the live site. So as changes and new sites appear on dimes, they'll be available also to use with this tool. So because I have this UK data, I'm going to pick the UK uh, site to use. So I've selected, I am interested in Cairngorms National Park, LTSER. And now I upload the 
data from Wikipedia. The wallet uploads, I, this is just while it's a pilot, but um, currently being worked on is um, having this work, not just with data sets on my computer, but within the storage sections that Mike showed you earlier that exist for all of the different projects in labs. And of course, as things like the digital asset registry get up and running in the central data nodes, we'll also just integrate directly with those so we don't have to mess around with you know, downloading and uploading stuff. There we go, uh, data set is uploaded and straight away on the right hand side, we can see that this is doing roughly what we want it to do. So we can see an outline of the Cairngorms National Park. We can see kind of mountain ridges that have, um, well, sorry, valleys that are kind of a little bit more polluted as the air covers there. Uh, and this little plot on the right hand side is just kind of indicative. So we can see, yeah, that looks about right. That's, that's what I was expecting. We can give this little plot a name. We want to use it. We don't have to use this plot, but if you want to just rough and ready graphic to accompany your new data set, this is certainly available. Um, and if we're happy with everything, we can just download that data. Or again, later on, we'll be saving this to the various ELTA uh, components. And if I open that downloaded data, um, it's a little bit small, but if we zoom in, we can see that this is the kind of the new raw data set. So all of the rest of the UK is gone. Now we just have the stuff for the Cairngorms ready, you know, average or, or whatever it is we want to do. Similarly, I can download the plots as well um, if we want to use it, don't have to, um, which just gives a nice little preview and uh, the title of the concept. So that is um, how it works with the with the um, the raster data set. Uh, we can also see an example of one of the um, uh, tabular data sets. So it's a similar process. Um, we can kind of we select that we want to work with one of these statistical data sets. Um, if we want, we can set in advance which which sites we're interested in. Um, which I won't do just yet. Uh, we'll see why in a second. And I'll just upload that data again um, and see the um, see the preview on the right hand side. For those of you who know uh, Elf platform Lord Terre Wazan might recognise the outline. Um, and we can tweak the uh, we can tweak the plot again. So there are three columns of data. Uh, the, the minute the preview just kind of shows one column, plots one column at a time. And what it's actually plotting is, um, I just change this. What it's actually plotting is the site itself. The outline of that never changes, but based off um, how you tell it to interpret the rows, if we just open the data set again, if we tell it that, okay, I want you to take the nuts zero regions or the nuts one regions, it will find different rows, uh, let you plot the different columns that correspond to those rows. And what we're seeing is each of those rows, the boundaries of those in real life are superimposed on the site itself. Um, so we can see that um, for Lotari Wazan, there are three, that's three regions uh, that kind of sit within the site. Um, and we have obviously a value of three for this one, uh, so it's five or six around here, and there's missing data here. Um, you'll notice that the uh, title of the plot is a bit janky. It's kind of been, it's kind of too long for the screen. It kind of gets cut off. Um, I've left this deliberately like this because um, rather than kind of making unilateral decisions about how they should be displayed, we just plot the name exactly as it appears in Dimes. Um, so for this one, for instance, we can see that it was about, uh, we can see that, yeah, this has got a really long name in Dimes, so fine, whatever, we'll put a really long name in here as well. Um, 
But this is just, you know, I've left it as is just because it illustrates that, you know, we are just taking things as they are in dimes. Similarly, the boundaries for all of the sites also, uh, also come from dimes. So for instance, you know, I can give this a new title again. Yeah, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, and I can download a new data set and I can download that plot again. So the plot we can see, yeah, it's still cropped when it's downloaded. So just be careful of this. The data itself, um, so we saw how the source data looks. I just want to explain a little bit the kind of the resultant data set. So obviously there were kind of hundreds and hundreds of rows in the um, in the in the source data, there's only four here because there are only four of those nuts three regions that sit within the boundaries of this site. Um, all we return is the codes, uh, the IDs of the sites that we're interested in. We have some friendly names. This is a uh, character encoding error that Excel has. The data itself is fine, don't worry about it. Um, but Excel doesn't, doesn't like uh, non, uh, non ASCII characters. So it's uh, this is just a little artifact that we see. So these three columns are just the data as they were in the original data set. We haven't modified or touched those at all. Those are just returned as is. Um, but then we have this final column, which has been added in as well. And this is supposed to represent the, the sort of the, the halfway intersection uh, that we talked about earlier. So for the Cairngorms, for example, what this number is in this column is the proportion of each uh, the proportion of each uh, area that sits within the site. So a number of one here would mean that this county was entirely contained within this site that we picked. A number of close to zero means barely any, there's just a tiny little bit that's included, so we put you the numbers anyway. Uh, and for the time being, this is what we can allow people to use to gauge you know, how they want to interpret these numbers. We don't kind of say how valid these numbers are. We don't say, you know, just times the data by the ratio and you'll get it fine. We don't make any decisions about that. That is up to you, the researchers, the users, uh, what you want, how you want to interpret those numbers. But um, this is just one possible way of kind of accounting for this fact that you know, the, 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 the zones don't quite line up. Um, there's lots of other things we could do instead. We could just have a kind of a binary yes, no, based off a certain threshold. We could just have a binary yes, no, include or exclude based off population centroids, whether those weighted fall within the boundaries. There's lots of different strategies we can use. They can all be added in at a future date, um, but this is just what we've chosen to kind of get started. Um, and a final thing, I think I'm running a little bit over time, so I will have to skip this sadly, but a final thing I wanted to just mention is that um, you've seen that there's quite a small list of sites in this interface at the minute, um, but um, again, developed within the notebook code um, is integrations with, with Dimes. So what's possible is if I, was interested in doing this cookie cutting with with Jonava Elsa. It's not an option. Um, it's not an option in the list for me to choose. So what I can do is I can just paste in the, the Dimes ID, hit add, and that's it. Will take a second or two to kind of fetch the boundaries and the name and uh, figure out which regions sit within it. But um, in a minute or two's time, which I don't have sadly. Um, that will then be available as an option to choose. So um, I believe that is about everything. So the, yeah, again, this is just one little amuse-bouche. Um, this is not the only thing we could do in labs. This is just starter. Um, just to kind of get the ideas flowing about what is possible with the kind of the shared analytical notebooks and, and science.